G'day guys and welcome to this interview episode of the Aussie English podcast. I'm actually really pumped to be bringing you this one because I had a lot of fun chatting with Justin Hammond today. He is the special guest on today's podcast. Now, Justin, I, he's been on my radar for a while. He has a really interesting story where he ended up over in Russia, learnt Russian and now has this hugely successful YouTube channel teaching Russians English or commentating on Russian culture from the, the perspective of an outsider, of someone from Canada. So, Justin got in contact with me recently because he has put together a course and initially he wanted me to do a promotion on the podcast and I told him I'm not really fond of doing ads or the idea of doing ads on the podcast. That's why you've never heard iTalkie or any of those other companies on here. Um, But I would love to check out the course that you've done and then I would actually prefer to interview you on the podcast to hear about your story so that listeners can learn English, they can hear about you firsthand, get to know you and then hear straight from the horse's mouth what your course is like, what's it about, and who it's going to help. So, Justin sent me the course and let me look at it for about a week and I have to be honest, I loved it. He has set up an amazing course that is very in line with how I like to teach English where it's it's not as focused on grammar points and just rote memory of parts of English, but more some more really cool aspects like culturally specific Uh, language that's used or culturally specific grammar um, or speaking specific grammar that is used. So, his course is really good. We're going to get into that in this interview, guys, but I wanted to give you 100% transparency. Um, I wanted to let you know what's going on, that I did get Justin on here to talk about this course because I endorse it and I will be receiving compensation as a result. Okay, so for the sake of transparency, I wanted you to know that and um, it's going to obviously help Aussie English keep moving, keep doing what it's doing. And also, Justin is wanting to get me to put together a section for this course specifically targeting Australian English. So, I'm looking forward to that. Anyway, guys, without any further ado, I bring you English teacher, Justin Hammond. Let's go. G'day guys, welcome to this episode of Aussie English. Today I have Justin who is an English teacher currently in Ukraine, speaks fluent Russian and is sort of sort of polishing up your Ukrainian would you say or are you sort of just, you're there but you're trying to sort of fend off Ukrainian from Russian, destroying your Russian? I'm definitely fending off the Ukrainian a little bit, um, especially with speaking Russian. I find it kind of chips away a little bit at my Russian, confusing me with certain words. Is that in Russian or is that in Ukrainian or whatnot? But yeah, no, it's it's been incredible here just to see the similarities between Ukraine and Russia, but also the differences at the same time. And which part um, are you in? Kiev, right? So, yeah, I'm in Kiev in the capital. Um, I'm here for a few months, and it's interesting because it is. It's like the same infrastructure as Russia, but the mentality that I'm seeing seems to be a little bit more westernized. So, it's interesting to see the way that's going. Yeah. And so, I mean, I would just love to hear about your story. That was part of getting you on today was to hear about how you ended up learning a foreign language such as Russian, teaching English, and then a course that you've put together, which is awesome, called Native English, which we'll get to at the end. But how did you get to here in a nutshell, Justin? Yeah, so essentially what happened was in university, um, because I'm originally from Canada, French is our second language, and when I went to study in our capital, Ottawa, everybody there spoke at least French, usually, as Mm -hmm. a second language, and then a lot of people also spoke a third language, and so me growing up in, you know, the western part of Canada, not the French part, um, we didn't really enjoy, you know, learning French, and so I only spoke English. And you get there and you kind of feel like a little bit of an outsider when you only knew one language. So in university, I knew that I wanted to learn a second language. Um, And I did know French from school or whatnot and and not too bad. But at the, the end of the day, you get people who will do a major and then they minor in like psychology. Yeah. And you're like, well, what does that get you? You know, a minor in psychology. So I wanted to do a minor in a language and I started in Chinese, actually. Jeez, um, straight to hard mode, dude. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. Straight into to Chinese, which surprisingly turned out to be, it's probably one of your easier languages to learn from a speaking standpoint, mm-hmm. um, an understanding standpoint. It's the reading and the writing. 
that makes it so hard, right? It's the reading and the writing because there's no system to memorize. You know, you have to memorize everything. Yeah, right? I, no I did that for three or four years at high school and I remember that was the nightmare. I was like, what do you mean? This, the, you just have to look up the base character within a character and then sort of hope <laughs> that you can find it in a dictionary. And I was like, this is so hard. <laughs> Yeah, it's, you know, just 20 strokes, right, like for a word or something. But uh, that was my big thing was, you know, grammatically, it was quite simple, right? And if you studied it, you know, you put anything in the last tense with one word, yeah, right? So uh, I enjoyed it, but I think that I couldn't really see myself living in China for two to three years, um, which is something that I felt was totally necessary for learning a new language, right? Like not just learning in the classroom, but actually going there and living there. So I was honestly just Googling um, top most spoken languages in the world because yeah. I wanted something that was useful. Um, switched into Spanish for a week and realized that when you learn Spanish in the West, uh, in university, it's you and 150 people in an auditorium, at least mm. like at the lower levels, right? Was that the and most me, common one taught there as well? Probably after French, yeah. Yeah, yeah French was big um, and German was pretty big actually. And uh, so I knew that wasn't the way to learn a language. And so after that, I switched into Russian, kind of looking at, you know, the most spoken languages. Again, it kind of goes English and Spanish in terms of, um, sorry, Spanish if you're including like, and Chinese, obviously, native speakers or whatnot. But when you're including uh, your native language plus your second language, it's English. Yeah. And so Russian kind of falls in around fourth or fifth, depending on the source you look at. Um, when you throw in the Indian languages and dialects as well. Um, but I wasn't as interested in those, so Russian came into play. And honestly, I've heard so much about living in China where everybody sees you as this foreigner, right? Mm. And all the time they want to talk to you, take pictures with you. And I feel like that could be fun for a little while, but I think <laughs> you need to, you know, be able to live a normal life. Yeah. And you'd start feeling so like Madonna every day that you leave the house. You'd be like, oh man, I can't handle it. <laughs> It's exactly what might happen. And so for me, it was like, hey, you know, I'm in Russia. Mm. I have to fit in. So, <laughs> Just you know, don't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> and for two years, you know, I lived there and honestly, almost nobody knew that I wasn't Russian. Some people could kind of tell from your face when they really look at you. But when you're just walking down the street, you dress like a local, you, you know, you go in, you do whatever you want. And it wasn't until, I, again, I started speaking that people would kind of notice. And so, you know. That and then I think the other bigger thing with, with respect to languages was I'd heard how in, say, France, for example, my roommate was from France, and he was talking about how another guy in our dorm grew up 30 minutes from him but had a different dialect. Wow. And I didn't like that idea of these different dialects, um, whereas with Russia, I've traveled the entire country, West Coast, East Coast, they speak the same, with the exception of the odd word that's different, um, yeah. the dialect. No difference in accent to me whatsoever. Really? Um, it's the same it's that the board. homogenous. Yeah. Wow. It is, it is. There are regional little kind of languages that come from the other nationalities and ethnicities that are there. Um, but Russian, by and large, is the exact same across the board. It's not like this Egyptian Arabic versus yeah, yeah. Arabic, right? Where people are like, oh, you learn Egyptian or you learn high German and low German. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a very standard and flush across the board. And then, of course, the other reason was you've got beaches in the south and mountains for snowboarding in the north. Right? So, <laughs> Ticked all the boxes. Yeah, so just kind of hit all those boxes. And then, of course, the intrigue factor, right? You know. Yeah, exactly. Um, and what, what was the process like of learning Russian, though? And what was your Russian like before you moved there to do the immersion? Did you have a very good level or did you just sort of jump in the deep end? So I had done one year in university, so your eight months of twice a week, which was nothing. Um, <laughs> got there my first night, got lost, and uh, met two younger guys. You know, I stopped them on the street, probably 19, 20 years old, and just didn't speak a word of English, and I barely spoke Russian. So I had to call my friend that I was going to see, and then put her on the phone, and then she translated everything. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I was quite surprised, I think. Um, especially having known some, you know, Germans and people from other, you know, Norwegian countries or whatnot, um, you kind of expect or you have this idea that, you know, you meet someone who's 17, 18, 19 years old yeah. that's English to you. Whereas in Russia, that's probably one of the, the biggest things is the young people don't. And if they're up until they leave school around 17 and they have to learn English up until that point, 
it's interesting if they're 15, 16, 17 years old, they probably can have a little bit of a conversation with you. But if they're 18, 19 or 20 and didn't continue to learn English after they left high school, it's, they can't. Right. So yeah, yeah, it's, I got gotcha. you. 20, 21, 22, it's because they're interested in it and they've continued to study it. It is yeah. such a funny thing, isn't it? Because it is that it's a very Western, at least English speaking country kind of arrogance of, oh, every foreigner speaks some English. So wherever I go in the world, I will be able to communicate with everyone because everyone learns my language. Whereas yes. I can't imagine, and, and it is something you assume, but once you start learning languages, I think you sort of get a bit of a wake up call to, to yeah. that and it not necessarily being the case, but I can't imagine, yeah, what it's like being someone who speaks a, a language that's only spoken by a small group of people and having to travel. Like I've had, my fiance came to Australia before she spoke any English and I was just like, I can't imagine putting myself in that situation where I was going somewhere to live and the people that I would be around would definitely not speak, say, Portuguese and I would have to yeah. learn their language. Whereas with English, obviously, you have no matter where you go in the world, you can pretty much say in any village who speaks English here and someone will put their hand up and be like, I can say a few things and I'll be able to like, you know, translate with a few gestures chucked in. Yeah. <laughs> and that's just it, right? Is I, I tell people all the time and, and I certainly tell myself, I almost wish that English wasn't my first language. Yeah. Because the only benefit the only benefit to speaking English as your first language is if you want to teach English. And even then, it's, it's that, that barrier or that, that gap is, is going down too, right? If you grow up and your first language is Portuguese, it's Finnish or whatever it is, depending on the country you're in, um, you're going to grow up speaking English and learning English anyways. Yeah. Obviously, as much in certain countries, but the resources especially there for someone learning English versus someone learning Finnish or Russian um, you know, if you want to learn English, you've got every resource available. So at the end of the day, um, it's way more beneficial for you to have that, whatever that foreign native language is for you as your first language, because then you're always going to speak that fluently. Whereas I'm never going to be a, like a, a perfect hundred percent Russian speaker. Exactly. Um, so, you know, I'd rather have had Russian as my first language and then learned English really, really well, like so many of my Russian friends have, and then had that kind of as, you know, your advantage. So, there's always that aspect. I always, I always get massive language envy with regards to people learning English because I know whatever language you speak, when you come into the English speaking realm, there is yeah. so many resources out there that you will drown in it, right? Whereas for me, wanting to learn Portuguese, even though there's like something like 200, 300 million speakers in the world, no one learns that language. They all learn Spanish or they all learn English and that's how they communicate. And so, there's just nothing. And I mean... When you get in there too, there, there is a lot of music and culture like that. But I guess I just get that envy of people when they start learning English. It's like, okay, every single big film in the world is pretty much going to be in English and you now have access to all this stuff. Um, so, I found yeah. myself when I was learning Portuguese and I started just getting Game of Thrones, putting the dubs on in Portuguese and then using Portuguese subtitles. I was just like, sweet, yeah. I'm set. And how's that for you? Learning it's, Portuguese. it's good. It's been really... I feel like I'm lazy though because it's so close to English, say, compared to Russian or Chinese or any of these other languages where it doesn't feel as big of a jump and I can kind of cheat quite often where you get a sense of words that are Latin-based or especially I speak French as well and so it's just... Anytime I don't know a word, I can pretty much take a guess at two different words or whatever that I know in English or French and if I put a Portuguese accent on it, it pretty much works. Okay. Did you find did you find that working with Russian at all with regards to learning vocab and grammar? Was it a big jump compared to learning, say, French or Spanish? It is a huge jump. Now, the interesting thing about Russian is for a certain period of time, the entire nobility spoke French. Yeah. So, there's a lot of words in Russian that are taken from French, are the same in French, wow. um, which is quite interesting that I never thought about. Yeah. Um, but it was. The whole... I guess let's say different alphabet, you know, using Cyrillic instead of English. That's the part that intrigued me so much was I did kind of feel like even just reading, you know, Spanish subtitles without knowing Spanish, you could still guess 10% of the words kind of yeah. thing. Because I like the idea of being like, no, I'm learning Russian. It's totally different. You know, this is me decrypting this entirely different language. Mm. Um, what's interesting, I was in Portugal two or three years ago and I was like, flown from Russia to Portugal. And I'm not, you probably won't notice it not knowing Russian, but I noticed it at the time that it, in Portugal, it sounded so often to me like people were speaking Russian. That's what I always say. 
I bet the Portuguese accent. I don't know if you miss it or not, but I just met an American. So nobody else agreed with me. In Portugal, they're all like, no, 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 no. And anybody else that, you know, mm-hmm. um, even talking to Russians, they're like, no, it sounds nothing alike. But I just met an American guy the other day here in, in Ukraine, and he's Portuguese. And he was saying, or sorry, he's Brazilian, but he was saying, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> I know that too. And he, and he was just as surprised that I said it and was like, thank you. Someone else finally agrees with me. Uh, I just had that moment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And nobody else seems to think that that's a thing. But um, even just like certain words, obrigado or whatever and mm-hmm. whatnot, you know, it's, to me just sounded so Russian. I thought people were speaking. I'd turn around, right? <laughs> And then, of course, you get like the um, let's say the more like like whiter looking Portuguese people, especially when I would hear those and think, oh, maybe it is Russian, right? Like yeah. you know, you're looking at their face and they don't look as you know, standard Portuguese. So that threw me off a bit in Portugal, but I, I loved it there. Far so. out. And so, what did you do exactly once you got to Russia? How did you boost your your Russian and get from beginner level, getting lost in the street, having to communicate with a friend on the phone with with some kids? to obviously now having a huge, hugely successful YouTube channel where all the videos are in Russian or in English with Russian subtitles. What was the jump? How did you get from A to B there? So, the biggest thing for me was just that intensive study at the beginning. So, when I went there for that first year, I was studying um, six days a week or five days a week, you know, a few hours a day in the classroom. And that's what really helped build that. I would even say just vocabulary base. Um, learning the grammar didn't work as well in Russia because they couldn't explain it to you in English. And so I was often having to kind of reference the grammar, or ask people about it. But even just from, you know, you're constantly being in it, you're constantly being immersed and building up the vocab. That's the big thing. Um, and then when it comes to remembering the vocab, because you're in Russia, I'm a firm believer in, you, in whatever you want to call it, the rule of four, rule of five, rule of six, where... You need to hear something or interact with it in some way mm-hmm. four or five six times before it sinks in. Yeah. So hear or learn the word in the classroom. Then I would see it in an ad on a street sign, and then I would hear someone speak it. And then you still not quite get it, but then the second time again after that, I heard someone speak it again. Then it kind of sunk in. That's pretty and much so me that- with people's names, I think. <laughs> Yeah. But when you're just studying, right, you know, you just you hear it one day, you hear it again the next day, but while you're studying, you know, and you're not really getting that repetition. And so the vocab doesn't sink in as much. Um, and then the other thing is being around the language. It's about mastering those conversational intricacies, the way they'll say something like, oh, like, oh, you know how. Right. There's all those little stutter words. Yeah. Um, you know, so as. I I remember that moment when I first started learning French and I was like, wait, you don't just translate every word in English into a French word and that's how it works when you speak another language? Isn't it just lined up the exact same way, but they're just different words? And then realizing, oh, crap, like you have to learn like expressions. I had no idea until I started learning French. I was like, what? Like in um, Portuguese, you say, um, one spears throw two rabbits instead of two birds, one stone. And yeah. so, it, it, that sort of stuff always blew my mind that you would find these expressions that were the same but totally different. <laughs> but, yeah, just the way they, they translated it. One, um, one trick that I've used a lot that I don't – it depends on how well you can benefit from it, but it's always worked super well for me. So, of course, you know there's a difference between saying something 100% grammatically correct and saying something the way a native speaker would say it. Exactly. So, uh, for me, what I found really worked well with Russian was, um, especially I had, a, I had a friend, Nikita, who has always spoken English at a very intermediate level. He's never gotten lower, he's never progressed. So, he still, he speaks really well, he understands everything I say, but when he speaks to me, he always speaks in a very Russian way. I can tell he's, he's transliterating from Russian into yeah, English. Yeah, exactly. So, so then when I would speak Russian, I would think about what I want to say and what I would do if I, if I didn't know sort of the most Russian way to word it in Russian, I would think about, okay, well, how did Nikita say this? How did he say it in English? <laughs> to think about the and structure. Then, exactly. So I would take what he said in English, yeah. which was wrong, and I would reverse translate what he said in English back into Russian, yeah. and that would usually yeah. give me the right Russian way of saying it. That's so So funny. I would do that so a lot. Funny. Um, really like just try and spend a lot of time talking to him, listening to how he would say things in English and he'd be talking to me in English, 
and I'm taking mental notes on, on what he's saying wrong so I can then reverse translate them in the future back into Russian um, because that's how I kind of learned the, the construction, which is, I guess, something similar that you would learn just from reading. Um, yeah, exactly. But, you know, take advantage of that intermediate level, whereas when they get higher than that, they kind of know the way to say it. And it doesn't really work anymore. But uh, that's happened with me and a few of my students who speak Portuguese and and Spanish. They tend to structure their sentences very differently. So you'll often hear them saying things like, "Probably I'll go tomorrow." Yeah. And you'll be like, "Ah, that's it's correct, but it's just not what native speakers would say. They will always say, "I'll probably go tomorrow." And then you have to get into a whole. Well, you don't have to, but if you really want to explain to them how it could be correct. You then have to open this massive can of worms about <laughs> had you not known what you were wanting to say, you might have started with probably, like probably, probably, exactly. probably but then that becomes a whole like emotional thing about what's going on in your head at the yeah. time. That's a whole other can of worms. I know. Right? That's it. That side of English I find is very difficult. I think probably with most languages, there you go, I've just used it, um, but I think with most languages you... You would learn them and you can communicate with lots of clunky grammar and misplacements and then it's that final sort of step from intermediate to advanced where you start using the structures that native speakers use that I, I like to really emphasize with students and, and on the podcast and everything where it's like, look, this might not be correct. Another one was like, you have something. A lot of the time you'll just say you got something or you've got something and it's kind of like it's not necessarily correct to say you got, you got 10 minutes to do this. You know, it should be, you yeah. have got 10 minutes to do this, but it happens and most people say that. And that's why I have an entire uh, lesson on using got in my course, because again, you, it comes down to, and I've done videos on it as well, we're kind of lazy, right? We're kind of lazy in that sense. Rather than saying, I arrived home at 8 a.m., mm -hmm. I bought a new car last week, I received a letter in the mail, we'll say I got home at 8 a.m., I, I got a new car last week, or I got a letter in the mail. And that's going to work 95% of the time. You know, you can replace exactly. the verb with got. Now, the only reason why I might say bought a car instead of got a car would just be, you know, because I'm explaining specifically the method in which I received it. Yeah. Um, you know, I didn't necessarily, like my friend didn't give it to me, it wasn't gifted to me. You know, you're trying to remove yeah. ambiguity, right? You're trying to say, okay, this is how it arrived here, or here, how I got it. It's not just it. This is the state. I have this thing. You want to know, okay, how did you get it? <laughs> it just gets lazier and lazier to the point where I explain something to somebody, and then you go, "Did you get it?" Yeah, right? Exactly. You, exactly. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. It, it just goes all the way down, and so you know, it's one of those things where. It's not wrong by any means to say I arrived, I received, or whatever. In fact, I think it's better. Um, it sounds, you know, it's much more rich. Well, and people kinda... understand, right? There is no, or there is a lot less ambiguity if you use those kinds of verbs. It's very specific. It's like, okay, I'm not going to be confused about what you mean when you say that. Yeah. I don't think I've ever really said, like, I arrived home last night at 10. I would say I would use arrive for a much greater sense. Like I arrived in Russia for the first time. Exactly. With flights, travel. Flights and travel. But like for just I got home last night. Whereas in Russian, you would use all these specific verbs. There is no got. Right. And so that's one thing that, again, speaking with Russians in English, yep. I started to learn why they were speaking like that. And then someone says, I arrived home at eight o'clock. And I go, why did you say arrive? Oh, because in Russian. Do we do that in English? Oh, no, we don't. And then that's how you kind of start to learn these cultural differences, I guess. Exactly. All right. Um, but before we get too deep into that, because we can talk about that at the end, and I'd love to go through quite a bit of it. How did you end up teaching English? And how did you end up with a YouTube channel? So teaching English, honestly, um, with Russia, extremely difficult to get there without a visa. Easiest way to get there is just to teach English, because then you'll have a school that will sponsor your visa. So I got, you know... Um, got into English teaching. That's really what that was all about. Um, you know, it was a part of it was that, oh, I'm going to graduate university, then go teach English for a year, right? Like so many people do. It's a way to get a job because you're not going to get any other kind of job that's not teaching English in Russia without, you know, an insane amount of experience and going through red tape. Gotcha. Um, so that was really just, again, it was a way to get me back and nothing more, um, unfortunately. But once I started doing it, I realized the demand for it um, and the need for it. So especially in Russia, where almost, uh, in, especially in their state schools or whatnot, 
there are no native speakers. It's Russians teaching Russians, um, which is totally fine. But of course, the result of that is, you know, mistakes that one teacher has are passed on or whatnot. Yeah. That's kind of the, the biggest thing that I, I noticed in Russia and, and kind of leading into my YouTube channel a little bit is people were coming and paying all this extra money to come to the school that I worked at or the language center and to learn from me as a native speaker, um, specifically for you know the pronunciation aspect of things, for the conversation practice, for the interest just from a cultural standpoint. Um, and I kind of found that, you know, and I did have classes where I taught, you know, beginners. And it felt so wasted because you're paying all this extra money to study with a native speaker when there's so many Russian teachers who are way better in English than I am. Yeah. Right. Exactly. They've learned grammar from their first days and all that stuff. So they're way better than I, you know, you or I ever will be. And, 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 you know, kudos to them because they've learned it so well. Um, I don't remember learning present continuous when I was a kid, you know, well, that that's, kind of thing. It's kind of a two-bladed uh, sword, right? Two-edged sword where you've kind of like, okay, I've, I've mastered this language and I can speak it well, but I don't know how it works. And so, you exactly. kind of have to go back and then, it, at least for me teaching English, I was the same sort of position as you. I finished university and was like, okay, I'll start doing this because there was a need for it. And I just enjoyed helping people and I had no formal training and I just started learning and I was just like, my God, some of these rules, some of these reasons why we do things is so sort of like just abstract. I would never have thought that was why. And it's it's so funny how much you open a can of worms when you get in there and start looking at the grammar and you're just like, Ugh. <laughs> It's very learnable. And again, thankfully, because... English is so popular, there are so many amazing resources, like even from a teaching perspective that you can draw upon um, to really help you out with that. And I'm a firm believer in not reinventing the wheel. Um, you know, I really like, you know, the idea of being able to, you know, how do I make this as understandable as possible um, and kind of go at it that way. And then with respect to the YouTube channel itself, um, there was kind of two sort of goals with it that connect into other things later but essentially one was um i was in russia and i would have all of these amazing conversations like at a bar with somebody on the street um in russian and because i was doing that conversation in russian they were so much more involved they had so much more respect for me and the conversations that we had were just incredible and then the next day you know i would kind of forget what we talked about and i kind of wished that i had recorded it you know on like an audio tape or something yeah um and say, you know, can I share this later? You I know, need to I review this. I need to review it. <laughs> exactly. And then, you know, I thought about doing a blog, but I, I couldn't really add, you know, the same kind of emotion into it. So that was kind of the main reason as I wanted to be able to share these conversations that I was having with people in Russia with the rest of Russians, because I knew that if this Russian in front of me was enjoying the conversation and, you know, thought it was hilarious when I would make this mistake or that mistake, mm -hmm. um, that everybody else would enjoy it as well. And then the second reason was um, when I was teaching, there was, I also worked with an American guy who didn't speak any Russian. And there were times during his class where his students would get up and leave, walk into mine and ask me to explain something to them in Russian. <laughs> Not out of respect or anything, but they were older adult students who just, yeah. they needed to explain to them in their native language. And I completely understood that because I needed a lot of things explained to me about Russian um, exactly. in English. So I completely understood that part of it. And at the end of the day, I know lots of people tout, you know, immersion, immersion, immersion. Um, but certain things, you simply need to understand how they work. And you need that 100% clear understanding of it. Exactly. Um, that, that could be, not always, but could be, you know, in your native language. So that kind of led me to the two types of videos that I do. One, these cultural videos, which is my thoughts on Russia, um, my thoughts on the language, people, everything like that, which kind of came from those conversations in, on the streets that I was having with people. And then the other type of video that I do is teaching English to Russian speakers, um, but of course being different and doing it in Russian so that I can say, hey, um, you know, I'd say if I can put the biggest focus on, you know, the biggest advantage to doing that in Russian and, and speaking Russian, um, specifically for Russian speakers, is when they make a mistake, I usually understand why they're making that mistake. Yeah. So I'm, I'll get on my video and I'll say, all right, you know, we'll take a simple example. If in English you say, what's that called? In Russian, you literally say, how's that called? Yes. And so they'll say, you know, how's it called when you do this? Right? Yeah. 
Um, and then I'll, I'll go back and I'll say, look, I understand in Russian, you're literally saying cock, right? Cock at the Nezavite. So like, what is this or how is this called? But in English, we're going to say, and then in Russian, I'll say the wrong way, but using the transliteration from English yeah. to be like, remember it this way in mm -hmm. your own language. Even though it's wrong for you, it'll be right once you translate it back for us. Exactly. And so having that advantage, um, you know, really gives that uh, that bonus. And then, of course, if you're doing it in their language, they want to watch the guy who's taking the time to learn their language, so they'll watch me, kind of thing. So yeah, I think you've uh, you've nailed something. And uh, I think uh, there's a lot of channels doing that now, where you notice um, native English speakers teaching English in a foreign language. So I think there's another one called Small Advantages, which is a, a um, an American guy in Brazil, and his channel is just going bonkers. But he's doing the same thing where he obviously speaks Portuguese at a very good level, and he does all of those sort of cultural things, and it, it's it's awesome. So what would your what what are the biggest hurdles that Russian speakers tend to have with learning English? Yeah, and what what advice would you have for the any Russians or I guess any English learners listening right now? What would the biggest piece of advice be when probably getting from intermediate to advanced? Mm -hmm. I think that for me, what I've noticed, you can have a very advanced level of English speak or yeah, of English speak incredibly well, but you will always always sound like a beginner if you don't use articles properly. At the end of the day. Um, and this is especially true for Russians because we have all this Western media that shows this terrible Russian accent and criminals and mafia. And if you listen to them, these guys speak great English, but the only thing that they do is they drop the articles. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's someone who's having like it's this mastermind criminal who's having this fluent conversation, been in America for 20 years, but still doesn't use articles. Really? So that's how you go. <laughs> that Russian scary sounding accent yep. is you say I am boy right you know you drop the app mm -hmm. and so I think that part of that mentality plays into the the effect of learn articles and you'll go from zero to a hundred in a second even if your English isn't very good if you can use articles properly you'll sound so much better than that advanced student mm -hmm. who doesn't use and when you when you say articles you're meaning a and and the right yeah, exactly. a and and the or no article, um, of course, depending on plurals and countability. Yeah, um, that's what I always ask myself. You know, I'm seeing my friend today, and, and she'll speak English, and I won't tell her what to say. I'll say, "What do we put before a noun?" Right? You know, you just said a noun. What do we put before a noun? Yeah. Right, and then she tracks, and so it's asking yourself those questions. Anytime you say a noun, right? Do I put something before it? Yes or no? Countable or not? Yes or no? Right? Add that was that was such a big thing too. Well, I've got a few students, one's from Azerbaijan and the other one's from Russia and they both have obvious, obviously languages where they don't use articles. And it was, yeah. it was so sort of mind opening when they, when I first sort of encountered that, oh, a language without articles, because I'm used to French and, and Portuguese, which have them and yeah. um, trying to explain it. And it is so funny when you sort of try and get into the nitty gritty of like, why do we use them in certain places? But it was as soon as they made that change and they started using them correctly, it was like, even though it was the most minute change that they had made, <clears throat> it made them sound like, you know, they had been learning for an extra year or two with regards to their advancement just overnight. 100%. Um, and then your next hurdle with articles is explaining to them why they're important. Yeah. Right. Because a lot of Russians just don't get like, why do I need them? Why can't I just say I am boy? And in an instance like that, you're 100% right. You don't mm, need the art. Exactly. How People understand. Good. They're not going to be confused. <laughs> but there are instances where you absolutely do need it. Yeah. And the difference is massive. Um, one of the things that I still can't figure out and I've asked Russians about is I'd found a book in, a, in a, a library in Ottawa. It's a Russian book. And the name of the book in Russian was just Scientist. And I'm kind of thinking, well... Is it a scientist or the scientist? Because <laughs> yeah. it totally changes, right? In English, you would have to have an article. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you would know whether or not it's about like a famous scientist, like the scientist, someone important, or just a standard whatever, you know, no-name kind of guy, like a scientist. And uh, they kind of, you know, never really explained to me which way they would interpret it. Like, oh, well, you know, once you read it, you'll understand. And I go, I know, but... <laughs> <laughs> I want to know before. Um, and the other uh, instance that I've, I've talked a lot about is um, for why it's so important is I was, my friend was meeting me at the airport before I was leaving the Russia and she was giving me a suitcase to take with me. So I was already there waiting for my flight. She was late coming uh, on a, in a taxi. And so I, I texted her, you know, like, hey, where are you? Where are you? I have to go. 
And I realized the card pulled up or whatnot, but she's saying, um, she texted me back saying, I'm, I'm talking to a taxi driver, a taxi driver. And I go, what are you doing talking to a taxi driver? You're late. <laughs> no, or not. Whereas had she said, I'm talking to the taxi driver, I would have understood that she meant the one who brought her mm-hmm. and they were probably discussing payment or where to go or something like that. But when she said a taxi driver, driver it made me think she was just chatting with a random person (laughs) who happened to be a taxi driver (laughs) (laughs) and so you know instances like that it becomes very important Mm -hmm. um, or whatnot so that's why even in russian i'm like had i wanted to say just a taxi driver i don't even know how i would have said that because to me exactly not having the article i would have in russian i would understand that as being specific but Without, I, what if had I wanted to make it non-specific, what would I have even done? You know, you have to so, go a different route, right, and explain things a bit different and give a bit different context to get that message across. Okay. Yeah, you could say like with a, you could say with another taxi driver. I probably could have said in Russian. That probably would have made sense. But yeah, so that uh, those are my two kind of stories about like why their articles are so important, um, especially when Russians tell me like that they don't get it, they don't understand why. Brilliant. And so, I guess this has obviously led to you, you know, you started this YouTube channel, you started teaching English and now you've got a course, Native English. What made you decide to create this and and who is it targeted for? Sure. So, my biggest goal um, with, I say, let's say teaching English is two things. One, to make learning from a native speaker or to make learning English in general as affordable as possible and as accessible as possible. So, affordable as possible because, again, um, especially having taught in a country like Russia, um, where there's not nearly as much money, them paying, uh, let's say, 30 U.S. dollars an hour, which would have been kind of standard, 30 to 40 U.S. dollars an hour for a private lesson, might work for a few people in Moscow and St. Petersburg, but for the rest of the country, you know, that's a day's pay, if not two. Yeah. Um, so, not everybody can afford that. So, I wanted to say, well, if you do have an amazing instructor who costs this much, well, how come everybody shouldn't be allowed to benefit from his knowledge? So how do you make um, that sort of learning uh, as affordable as possible? And that's kind of how I came to the whole self-study online course, where you can take somebody's knowledge and put it all into one place. Um, And then, of course, the price is lower. And um, with that being in that format, online course, it then becomes accessible as possible to everybody. So again, um, it's not just the people living in that instructor city that should be able to the benefit from him, it should be the people in Siberia as well, and the people in Egypt, and the people in France that are all learning English. Um, so how do you take learning English from a native speaker or in general and make it as, one, affordable as possible, and two, as accessible as possible? So that's how I came up with the idea of um, doing the online course. That format kind of satisfied both elements of that. Um, the other reason why, um, with the course itself, it's focused on uh, spoken English, And the reason for that is, as I was saying when I was teaching in Russia, students were coming to me for that conversation practice, for the the pronunciation element, for hearing the way you structure your sentences, all that kind of stuff. So if they wanted to learn grammar, I'm not going to try and go out there and and make this course and be an expert on grammar um, if I'm not. Yeah. Right. So I want to take that biggest advantage of being that native speaker um, and make that course surrounding that. So that's kind of how that came about. Um, and, and of course, with it being that higher level, the course is intended, I'd say, for students B1 and up. Yeah, um, I got that feeling. Know. I was like, man, this feels like it's targeted beautifully at intermediates to advanced, you know, getting them over that, that initial hurdle of you understand it, you can hear the English, you can, you can, you know, pass it through your mind, you can communicate, but you now want to sort of polish everything up and get from intermediate to advanced. Exactly. And that's really where the focus is. Um, I've been asked to do a lot uh, to do a beginner course. But again, that brings me back to, okay, I'm going to I'm going to have a Russian instructor do that. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'll explain that in language and the people I've talked to that have um, asked for that have also said they would like it in Russian. And again, that comes back to me not trying to be a master of something that I'm not when there's, you know, a Russian instructor out there who can explain it perfectly to them, knows the grammar better than I do, um, or whatnot. As so, you said earlier, why reinvent the wheel and, and why give yourself something harder to do than someone else could do for less time, less energy? Exactly. So, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's been an interesting uh, route and I like the idea of being able to constantly 
um, you know, push updates into the course. So if I work one-on-one -on -one with a student, work with them for six weeks or whatnot, but then, hey, here's a new element of what I'm teaching people now. If we're only ever working one-on-one, -on -one, they don't get that. Yep. Um, whereas now when you, you purchase the online course, you have lifetime access to it and all the future updates. So anything else that comes out, I'm working on another big update for it right now. Again, all those people, uh, they can go back, they can review it, you know, especially if they want to review a certain lesson or something like that, but they also get that future access as well. So that's really the, uh, the big thing behind it. And in the sense of the way it's growing or whatnot, um, you know, like we were talking about, even with the language dialects or whatnot, um, I'd like to see it kind of grow into, you know, a big group of uh, native English speaking friends helping each other, um, helping students learn um, and kind of building that up and making that information as accessible as possible. Um, Cause I think that, you know, you can spend a lot of time just kind of sitting in the internet and finding things that are outdated. And it feels um, good too, right? You can get into that mode of being collector obsessed where you go out, you know, it happens to me. I always see things I want online, books, whatever I buy them, but I don't actually use them. And especially if it's free, if you get them for free, quite often the biggest problem is that you don't use it because you didn't pay money to, you know, your hard earned money for that thing. And so you're just as happy to not touch it again and forget about it. So, but I love, I was going through it and I really love how concise your lessons are. They tend to be between, you know, five, usually five to 10 minutes long, sometimes 20 minutes long on the more advanced ones later on. Um, but that was really good. Just how dense it was. Can you talk about how you decided to structure it? Because I thought that was beautiful too. So the structuring element for me, I was really focusing on that one stop shop idea. Um, you know, you come in, you get access to whether it's productions, it's phrasal verbs, it's idioms and expressions. Um, but it, I wanted it to be more of a pragmatic or logical sort of sequence. So you kind of start off and you've got, hey, these are the strategies that, you know, are going to work for you, but you also need to be keeping in mind while you go through the course. Then we go through a whole bunch of information, right? You can't avoid that. Yeah. Right? Here's what yeah. you have to know. Right? So this is where we're going to go through your idioms and expressions, your slang and whatnot. The important part of that is these are the ones that we're actually using in the West versus somebody who goes and goes, oh, well, why can't I just go into Urban Dictionary and look up exactly. something? Well, you open up Urban Dictionary, 95% of what's there we don't use. It, it is, is very specific to very few small pe a small amount of people in one location in you know the exactly. West of the US. <laughs> so what I tell people with, with Urban Dictionary for anyone that's listening and has looked at it before is never go in and just – browse through the terms there yeah however it's a great resource if you hear something so if you hear someone say something exactly. then you go and look that up then it becomes a great resource for that i think that's um, something that's that intermediates tend to find very difficult too you you got to you can learn all these words and you can work it out but you need to sort of start learning which ones are actually used versus which ones are kind of like sometimes written sometimes used by academics sometimes used very slangy you kind of need to learn that that by touch and feel and actually using references reading watching movies and then saying okay i've heard it i'll use it and i'm always saying to people if you don't if you haven't heard someone use it and you don't have any context ignore it don't use it just leave it alone don't just pull a word offline and try and use it uh, online and try and use it in a conversation because you're probably going to misuse it that's a good rule yeah that's a very good rule to implement um, with respect to the structure. So again, it's those high level strategies, then all the information, here's what you need to know. And then we go into, okay, and not in the sense of like, hey, don't believe us, but let us show you it actually being used. And that's yeah. why we have that street unit in there. That was um, awesome. That was where you guys were just out in the street chatting with people in English, right? With sort of real exactly. life contextual subjects that you were chatting about, like music and sport and and that sort of exactly. stuff. And Azrin, great teacher, goes through um, and does a whole lesson based on that conversation. So yeah. that, you know, we, we literally filmed all these conversations and then we'd sit down, we'd hit pause, boom, an expression, write it down, boom, yeah. expression, write it down. Give you the example from the video um, and then say, here, look, here's what it means, here's how it was being used, et cetera, et cetera. So actually seeing these expressions that are coming out in real conversations. But then, of course, you get access to hearing how people make mistakes. You get access to hearing how people, you know, sound when they're stutter, when they're nervous, when they're excited, right? So you get those different levels of emotion even in there. And then once you've learned all this information, probably the number one or number two question that I get 
Um, the top two questions I get from students are one, how do I start learning English? Where do I start from? The second one is how do I find people to talk with? Yep. Right. How do I find people to practice with? And so again, this whole idea of like delivering this massive course and then saying goodbye, you know, didn't really make a whole lot of sense to me. Is exactly. how do you take you had you such know? good actionable content there at the end. I think you were like, okay, guys, here is what you want to do if you want to go and make friendships and, and long-lasting relationships with people who speak English in order to yeah. practice your English. So, it was good that you finish it up with all this actionable stuff that they can kind of like do all this learning but then go out and use it in the real world environment. Exactly. And so, the idea becomes, well, okay, I've learned it all. What do I do with it now? How do I find people to practice with? And thankfully, we have technology that allows us to, to do that. And essentially, it comes down to um, not going and approaching people from the sense of a language exchange. Um, because again, those are just standard sort of almost business relationships, right? We're going to speak 30 minutes in my language and then 30 minutes in your language. Right? And it comes down to this very business relationship thing. Whereas the way I look at uh, learning languages from people is, I'm helping somebody. Who do I normally help? I help my friends, right? I help my friends. So exactly. how do you, it's more about becoming friends with these people and offering your help in exchange for their help, but you're not talking about exchanging languages. So if you like scuba diving, if you're Portuguese and you like scuba diving and you want to practice English, there's thousands of people that you can talk to that have no interest in learning Portuguese that are scuba divers, which means you'll have to speak English with them all the time. Exactly. So how do you, you know, how do you meet these people? How do you get connected with them? Um, what's the right way to introduce yourself um, to offer that value? That's kind of what that whole section is about to really get you that free uh, English speaking practice um, and then some sort of other tricks and tips that you can do to, to get that way. But yeah, that was for me the whole big thing, right, is what do you do at the end of the day once you've learned all this information? How do you practice it? I think I think it's really good and I think that anyone who is at that stage right now where you're not massively advanced but you're at the intermediate trying to get over that hump of sounding more natural and and learning the kind of of language that native speakers would use because I love you had culturally focused speaking and you had speaking focused grammar those sections in there were absolutely awesome especially the culturally um, speaking focused speaking section I thought that was just brilliant because you're sort of talking more about well what do people actually say? And even if they're different genders, they may use different words or different expressions, you know, and I get that in Australian English. Can you say mate to a woman? And it's kind of like, Ugh. no, you, you don't tend to do that. Women may really? do it to other women, but guys will not call women mate unless it's kind of a very blokey kind of guy, a very manly, um, manly kind of girl. And yeah, it, it, yeah. you know that it's okay. Okay, so that's. It. I honestly didn't even know that. So that well, it, there's, uh, and there's those rules everywhere, right? So it is. It is really good, and I think this will be a really good resource for anyone who isn't currently in an immersive environment as well, especially if you're preparing to try and um, potentially study overseas or go overseas um, shortly. Yeah, absolutely. It uh, it's been an interesting run and whatnot with the uh, the culturally focused speaking section. A lot of that came from real situations where I'd seen students end up in either an uncomfortable situation or had just come as a result of me talking to English students. Because um, one big thing that I noticed in Russia was uh, somebody would introduce themselves and say, I'm from this city. And I'd say, where is that? And they go, oh, it's 200 kilometers north of St. Petersburg. Yeah. And I, I loved that. I loved it. I loved how specific that was. <laughs> I think it's better. I don't know what, how it works in Australia, but in North America, we would never, ever say that. You would say it's a two hours drive. It's a four hour flight based on whatever is the most popular way of, of traveling there. Yeah. I would never ever say Ottawa is four hours or is a 400 kilometers from Toronto, right? Unless somebody actually wanted to know how far away that is. But even then I would answer it's a four hour drive. What are you talking about? <laughs> so that, that idea of it's 100% correct to say what you've said. In fact, I love it and I think it's even better. Yeah. But you want to blend in and, and sound like a native speaker, here's the better way to say it, at least according to North American English um, or whatnot. And so those are those kinds of things where you talked about uh, the the whole 
genders of certain things that we use to refer to our friends, like mm, boyfriend. That's what I was going to say. I loved that section where you explained using boyfriend versus girlfriend and how that's used. Can you explain that? Sorry, quickly. Absolutely. So I had a student um, in my class and it was a group of teenagers. So of course that was, you know, unlucky for him, but he had said, <laughs> My boyfriend did this, and I knew what he was trying to say, but the other students are laughing at him, and it's because in Russian you will say, you know, like, my guy friend, or yeah. whatnot, or they have two separate words for friend, they have a word for guy friend and a word for female friend, um, or whatnot, and so again, you kind of have to explain that, so he said, you know, boyfriend, and the other students were laughing, and I go, okay, I need to share this with other people, <laughs> so other people don't end up in his situation, and so that's what it comes down to, is... Um, and I'm sure it's the same thing for you. Certain terms that we use to describe people can p completely change depending on who's doing it. Exactly. Or who's speaking, right? So a girl can say girlfriend about her female friend, but a guy can't say girlfriend unless he's dating her. Yeah. Right? But you can say female friend. Exactly. And in fact, you have to say female friend to differentiate that. And then it comes down to, you know, a little bit further, it's even adjectives. Right? You know, you can't call a girl handsome. Right? <laughs> we don't call a girl handsome. And girls, when they call guys, they will call guys pretty yeah. or beautiful. But there's usually a very feminine association with that. Like he's a, uh, because mm -hmm. if you say pretty boy, that's obviously something very, you know, left field. But. Well, that's it. You wouldn't, that. you wouldn't, I'm not going to say, here's my boyfriend, isn't he beautiful? You, your automatic yeah. assumption would be that I am gay and this is my romantic partner who, exactly. um, yeah, and I found that really interesting because it is something that a lot of English teachers probably don't even think about when they're trying to teach English. They don't think about these culturally um, focused speaking points and it is so important if you want to avoid those kinds of embarrassing situations where people will understand with context, but it's always nice when you're learning a language to avoid humiliating things. And the one that I always say in Portuguese is that I used to try and say when I was trying to say I'm excited about something. And it's the same in French. If you say je suis excité or eu estou excitado, it means I'm horny. It doesn't mean that I'm excited. You have yeah. to say animated. You have to use the equivalent of animated to be like, I can't wait for this movie. I'm so horny. It's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> So you, so you learn. Maybe that's why French is so romantic. So. Exactly, exactly. But that's it. And I mean, I guess too, I kind of say, just go and make these mistakes. It's not a big deal. And the good thing is you'll make them once and, you'll, and you will never forget again. You know, if you accidentally introduce your mate and tell everyone that he's your gay lover and people ask you about how long you guys have been together, you're never going to forget again that you made that mistake then yeah, you'll only do that once. You will only do that once. And it's the same thing in Russian. They use, um, when you say, for example, I enjoy something, um, you'll often say, I get pleasure from. Yeah. Right? Which, of course, immediately, <laughs> I go, guys, um, I was at a speaking club, and the guy had a, some type of bird at home. And he's like, yeah, I get pleasure from my bird. And immediately, I just stopped him. Of course, nobody else understood. I just stopped him right there and said, yeah. let's fix <laughs> Let's fix this right now, guy. Like, yeah, you can't say that. That that's got a sexual connotation. <laughs> yeah, no, and that's good. I should do a video about that. So it, uh, yeah, one hundred percent. It's uh, it's one of those things where everybody at the end of the day, English speakers are going to understand what you meant, right? But just even just avoid those awkward little funny sort of scenarios. Um, here's what we're going to be talking about, and especially with that culturally focused unit or culturally focused speaking. Um, I really wasn't sure how to title that. And then I, I like that, that narrowed down culturally focused speaking. And I, I scoured the internet looking for similar styles of things, but I really couldn't find them. It's not a big focus point for, for learning. That's when you know you're onto something. That's when you know you're onto something. If you can't find other people teaching those sorts of things and you know they're important, you've nailed it. Yeah, there's no sort of like... Um, you'll find the odd sort of thing that kind of touches on a point, but it's not part of like a larger scheme of, you know, what is culturally focused speaking or whatnot. And that's why I had to think of um, uh, to how to name that unit. Same thing with the grammar. Uh, the grammar unit, I'm not trying to reinvent um, the wheel or to even try and say, you know, there aren't Russian teachers out there who are way better at teaching grammar. My whole point of the grammar unit is I'm not going to teach you articles. I'm going to teach you why you need to, you know, focus on articles or whatnot. And here are the main grammar aspects as they specifically relate to speaking, right, to sound better with speaking. There are certain grammar points that are the best to focus on. 
some, you know, grammar mistakes you can make and it's fine. Others, when it comes to speaking, you really want to have nailed down, especially with that informal conversation. And of course, I start that unit off with articles, right, for that exact reason. So Exactly. It, well, uh, I think you've nailed it and I think it's a great course. So, for anyone who's at intermediate and wanting to sort of get over that hump to advance and sound a lot more natural when they're speaking English, where can they get their hands on this course, Justin? So, we can put the... Uh, uh, link down below, but essentially it's on lingova.com. Yeah, uh, all the links yeah. will be in the in the description. Awesome, awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. And I will post all the other links to all your other relevant channels because I'm sure there's hopefully the odd Russian um, speaker listening to this podcast who can who can check it out. But unfortunately, guys, if you want to learn from Justin, you need to sort of probably learn Russian first, at least on YouTube. On YouTube, yeah, definitely. The, uh, the course itself is for anybody um, speaking any language. But yeah, the YouTube channel itself is focused to Russian speakers. But yeah, thanks for having me on. Super appreciate it. And I hope uh, people can hear the differences between our accents and really kind of narrow down the different ways. But I think at the end of the day, we speak 100% the same for the most part so exactly. I think it's just accent for the most part and maybe the odd slang term like mate or bloke. Major bloke, yes. We don't say either. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. Well, Justin, thank you so much again. And I'll have to have you on again soon to chat about what's going on in Ukraine. Thanks, Pete. Appreciate it. No worries. All right, guys. So, I hope you really enjoyed that interview. Justin, thank you so much for coming on. You're an absolute legend for coming on here and telling us all about your story and about this course, Native English. Now, guys, I wouldn't suggest this course for really, really advanced learners. It's an amazing course, but it will probably cover things you've already learned. However, if you are an intermediate English speaker, this course is going to be perfect for you, getting you over that hump through that plateau to advanced English. Now, if you would like to sign up for this course, go to lingova.com. That's L-I-N-G-O-V-A dot com. The link will be in the transcript and you can use the coupon Aussie as in Aussie from Aussie English, A-U-S-S-I-E. And this will save you 15% off the total cost of this course. Now, remember guys, if you are Russian, you can check out Justin's channel. Unfortunately, if you're not Russian, like me, you probably won't get much out of his channel because 99% of it is in Russian. Um, But you can go to YouTube and just type in Justin Hammond English. So, that's J-U-S-T-I-N space H-A-M-M-O-N-D and you will find him on there. Or you can visit him on Instagram and Twitter at Justin Ocheck. That is J-U-S-T-I-N-O-C-H-E-K. So, that's it for today, guys. Again, thank you, Justin, for coming on. Guys, check this course out and I will chat to you next time. Peace.